Your bright light is super. Okay, do I start? Okay, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending the Bria's talks 11 and 12 already. Um, for you who don't know me, I'm Nelda Nurenare. I'm from the Pre University of Brussels. I'm the academic co director of the Green Deal team of Bria's. Um, and in that capacity, it is my pleasure to introduce a Dr. Jeroen Kandel from the Public Administration and Policy Group at Wageningen University. Um, about 10 months ago, I was debating who to invite for the BRIAS, uh, as BRIAS fellow to work on food systems and green deal policy. And I contacted an acquaintance at a, a European green tank and I asked him who to invite, who's working on food security and green deal. And uh, he told me literally interesting things are coming from Aachen University. <laughs> so Jeroen Kandel is a living example of that. He, um, he, I contacted him and he immediately he shared my enthusiasm for Brias and agreed to join us here in Brussels. And I am so uh, happy that he did. He is an expert in public governance and food security, has published extensively on food systems, agricultural policy, sustainability, EU policy making, and many other topics. Um, he is a member of the Dutch Council on Animal Affairs and of the Supervisory Board of the Transisi Coalition Putso or the Transition Coalition Food in the Netherlands. I am very happy to have him here and looking forward to hear his talk on how to foster EU food democracy. You don't even have the floor. Well, thanks a lot so much, uh, Nell, and it's a pleasure, pleasure to, uh, to talk to you today about uh, food democracy. Uh, also, the people attending online, thanks for your uh, for your patience. Um, a brief. I, I'd like to start with a brief introduction uh, about myself. Even though uh, I've seen uh, quite some of you already for uh, for many times, uh, you might still wonder who this uh, this chap is. Uh, well, I'm a, an associate professor in Wageningen at the uh, Public Administration and Policy Group. You could say we're the, the political scientists of, uh, of Wageningen. Um, and, and well, our team is really uh, specialized in the life sciences domain. So personally, I'm working mostly on food and agricultural policy. Um, many different uh, research projects, which I'll show in a minute. Uh, but the overarching question I try to tackle in my research is well, how governments can do better to steer food systems toward more sustainable outcomes. A bit of uh, shameless self-promotion. Uh, we've also written some books. Uh, including one, it's called 10 Billion Mouths, uh, in which we collected contributions from across Wageningen and across uh, disciplines reflecting on, on, on the global food challenge. Uh, so if you ever uh, had the ambition to, to learn Dutch, this might be a good reason uh, to do so. Shortly about Wageningen, it's a, it's a small university town in, uh, in, in, in the mid-east of the, of the Netherlands. Uh, it's known because the ceasefire between the Allies and the Germans was signed there in 1945, uh, as well as for, for housing uh, Wageningen University, which is a relatively small university, but I would say with a big name in its field. Uh, well, all of you work on food, so I think you've come across Wageningen before. Um, and then I am part of the public administration and policy groups, so a relatively small group working on uh, well, uh, approaching these typical Wageningen topics, food, climate, water, uh, uh, from, uh, from a political science perspective. Personally, I supervise a range of uh, PhD and postdoc projects. Uh, it's, it's really quite diverse. So, so here are some of the PhD and postdoc collaborators uh, that, that, I, uh, that I supervise. You'll see that it ranges uh, from uh, urban food policy uh, towards circular agriculture, uh, um, uh, promoting the resilience of European farming systems. But again, they all have to do with this question of, OK, how can governments do better? Ranging from, from local to, to international levels, ranging from Europe uh, towards a global uh, South context. Now, to start with a bit of a problem statement, um, and we've been talking, uh, especially in our sub theme on the, on the Green Deal, about this challenge of, uh, of fostering a transition of the European food system toward more sustainable outcomes, which is very high on the European political agenda, and you could say it's really a cornerstone of the, uh, of the Green Deal of the program of the European Commission. Uh, 
Um, and I, I'm not going to repeat all the, the challenges uh, um, in, in the European and global food system. I think Alan Matthews, uh, Ratana, uh, 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 Peu and, and, and Pauline Schilbeek have uh, done an excellent uh, job in, in showing the range of issues, uh, um, well, the pressing societal issues that originate from the food system as well as covered a range of possible interventions that governments can adopt, could adopt, to, uh, to address these issues. Um, so there's a very large body of, of literature uh, about how governments could do better, but what we see in practice is that they struggle to do so, and that's also a bit of a personal frustration, and there's, there's more and more studies about uh, uh, different pricing systems, for example, putting prices on emissions, the need to change food environments, the, the role that food education could play, uh, the, 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 the importance of extension. Um, and but we see that so far governments, uh, uh, well, insufficiently act upon these, uh, these, these advices. So uh, you, could, you could argue that the, the pace and depth and scope of change has, uh, has, has, has fallen short if you, if you look at the uh, legislative objectives uh, uh, that we've committed. So I would argue, even though uh, there's of course many scientific challenges that we still need to overcome, that that's really fostering a transition of the food system is first and foremost a political challenge. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to uh, to summarize all of the challenges, uh, but let's put it in a in a positive way. I think the, the challenge is to get inside the donut, and maybe some of you have come across this 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 heuristic of the Oxford uh, economist Kate Rayworth before uh, the donuts uh, distinguishing between the well, the outward ecological ceiling of our uh, planetary system as well as the social foundation. Well, there's a range of planetary boundaries that we're already uh, crossing, um, um, and, and the challenge would be to, to realize a, a planetary system, but especially also a food system, and you see it on the right, uh, which is in Dutch, but it basically translates these ideas of the, uh, the, well, the Earth system into, uh, into the food system. So the challenge is really to realize a food, a safe and, and just space for humanity to produce, consume food and everything in between. But today I'm going to focus mainly on the why question. So not so much what could governments do, but why have they not done so? Uh, so that's what I'll cover in the first blog. And there's much to say, so I'll, I'll really uh, stick to the, uh, to the essentials. And then let's see uh, what, what questions might emerge during the discussion. Um, and I will then uh, shift the focus toward a development that I personally find very uh, uh, promising, which is the emergence of all sorts of food democracy initiatives. And I will show you various examples of these, these food democracy examples and reflect on their merits, but also some of the, the pitfalls involved. And I will end by what we can learn from these experiments uh, uh, for the European Green Deal. As a short recap of the Green Deal, again, uh, uh, Alan Matthews, Pauline Schilbeek has have, have given an overview in their lectures about some of the uh, objectives under the, under the Green Deal. Uh, I think two of the main strategies under the Green Deal for the, uh, for the food system are the biodiversity and uh, farm to fork strategies, which cover a whole range of, of objectives uh, relating to food production, food consumption, tackling food waste. Uh, uh, allocating 10% of European farmlands to biodiversity uh, purposes. Uh, and so it's really quite diverse, although some objectives are, are more concrete uh, and, and better supported by, uh, by, by instrument mixes than, than, than others. Now, in a recent publication in, in Nature Foods, uh, me together with a colleague from Wageningen, Hannah Chavez, have outlined some of the challenges um, in, in, in further implementing this, this food system agenda at the European level. And I think these four points also explain why progress is so slow uh, and why we, we, well, we already see um, um, that the, uh, well, the farm to fork uh, is so far not really making an, 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 a, a big impact uh, both on, 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 on in terms of policy change, but also on the ground to date. I'd just like to go through these uh, one by one, and I, I think, uh, well, especially also the first might might resonate 
will give that, even though, well, there's this overarching objective of, of realizing a sustainable food system. Food system sustainability remains a bit of a, a container concept. Eh? Uh, I think we're all aware that there's these different uh, so social, e economic, environmental sustainability. Uh, it's not really a concept that anyone disagrees with, uh, but which at the same time also obscures a lot of possible dissensus about what priorities we should, well, what objectives we should actually prioritize, what sorts of interventions should be introduced to, to meet those objectives. Um, and, and, well, uh, I think it has become quite uh, apparent in the, uh, in the scientific literature that there's all sorts of trade-offs uh, involved uh, that currently remain uh, un largely unaddressed. And we know also from research on the sustainable development goals that when these sorts of, of large overarching policy agendas are being translated into concrete indicators, that often economic and social indicators tend to prevail over environmental ones. Whereas I would argue that, well, the largest uh, uh, contributions that, that the Green Deal seeks to make are, are particularly environmental ones, uh, contributing to the Paris climate agenda, loss of biodiversity, etc. So there's a real danger of depoliticization, suggesting that uh, uh, everyone would agree with, with this range of goals uh, and, and downplaying uh, the differences in values that exist in society in the food system, um, 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 as well as not making hard uh, uh, and difficult political choices. Second, we see that even though the Green Deal and especially the Farm to Fork, it's quite uh, elaborate in terms of the objectives, uh, which really cover the whole of the food system, we see that instruments uh, lag behind. And so there is insufficient uh, support of uh, instrument mixes to actually realize these objectives. Um, in addition, we see that there's all sorts of incoherencies uh, between the different policy domains and policy efforts across the EU that should contribute to these uh, overarching objectives. And there have been a big debate, uh, which I think this, this cartoon portrays quite nicely about, for example, the contributions that the new Green Deal could make to the, uh, the new common agricultural policy could make to, to the Green Deal. And quite some uh, commentators and scientists have been quite skeptical about the, the latest reform, which was concluded last year. And then again, even if there are policy mixes on paper, and we often see that, especially in the environmental uh, uh, domain, that uh, problems emerge in the implementation phase. Uh, for example, in the Netherlands, Flanders, uh, there's, there's big uh, challenges uh, related to, uh, to nitrogen emissions, which uh, have uh, violated uh, uh, the EU Habitats Director, so a director for nature protection which has already existed for, uh, for about three decades. Uh, so if we're talking about new targets, but we, we already struggle to meet some of these much older targets. Then there's a question of horizontal coordination. So within the European Commission, as in any governmental system, we see that there's quite some tendencies between the different director generals, as we call them, that are involved. Then you could compare them to national ministries. We see Frans Timmermans, the, the vice president, of the uh, European Commission responsible for the Green Deal. Um, well, bluntly put, fighting quite some turf wars with the Commissioner of, 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 of Agriculture, Wojciechowski. Um, we see uh, Commissioner Stella Kirikiades, who's formerly responsible for the, uh, for the uh, uh, farm to fork strategy, but has, has, has been uh, mainly uh, well, has had to spend most of her time and energy on, on COVID over the last years. Uh, and we know also from the political sciences that, that different departments also have different constituencies and even fundamentally different worldviews, which might clash with each other. And this is just a commission, but then we see the same happening in the Council of, of the European Union, where the, the different uh, groups of ministers meet, as well as in the European Parliament, which is also organized along these specialized uh, committees, and then first they need to co need to com come to compromise within the institutions, and only then they can uh, they, they they start negotiating among themselves. So, uh, meaning that it, uh, this also explains why European policy change often takes a long time. Now we explain this uh, uh, often using the, the concept of closed policy communities, sometimes also referred to as iron triangles. So we see that the Commission. Um, 
the uh, well, the, the many policy domains, uh, many policies are typically being made in relatively closed networks of actors, uh, which largely sh share the same sets of beliefs. And agricultural policy is perhaps the archetype example of, of uh, a closed policy community or sometimes even labeled clientelist politics uh, being mentioned in the political science literature, where you see a very and this is a picture from, from the US, but I think it, it applies almost one on one to, to the EU, where you see a very strong uh, collaborations traditionally between the legislative, uh, so that's the Congress in the US, but the European Parliament and national parliaments in the EU, interest groups, uh, especially from the agricultural sector itself, uh, and the bureaucracy. And so DG Agri has traditionally been quite, quite open to the interest of, uh, of farmer groups. Uh, and the same applies to, to, to national means. This is not unique to agriculture. We see this in many, many sectors, uh, but these ties are typically quite, quite strong in the agricultural sectors. And many uh, uh, actors uh, outside of this network, like environmental NGOs, they, uh, well, they, have, they, they have challenged these, uh, these closed policy networks and also have over time tried to, uh, to get a seat at the table, uh, sometimes even, even literally. Uh, and well, you could argue that the Green Deal shows that they, they have been increasingly successful in, uh, in, in indeed getting access to policy. Our final challenge originating from this, this, this paper is that apart from a horizontal coordination, coordination challenge, there's also a vertical coordination challenge. So not all problems uh, confronting the food system can be solved at the Euro European Union level, and that is because uh, the EU simply does not have competencies over all of these issues. Uh, issues like uh, um, uh, fiscal policy, which many academics would argue could be a very effective uh, intervention, uh, 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 for example, uh, soda taxes or putting a price on, on, uh, on, on inputs or emissions as different ways in which you could organize it, food education, uh, uh, spatial planning policies to also change the food environment and the supply of fast food uh, in, in, in neighborhoods. This all requires close collaboration with the member states, uh, with local authorities, but also with international organizations. I think Ellen has uh, had a very nice uh, uh, webinar on that, uh, reflecting on the global implications, also the need for global collaboration to tackle these food system challenges. So of course, this, this, this picture further complicates the challenge of fostering a food system challenge uh, even more. Now, if we look at the member states, so what we've seen over the last years is that the European Commission tends to be quite ambitious and has at least proposed a range of policies to, well, which I would argue, uh, they've at least done, done their best in trying to to, to propose policy mixes that would, would allow us to, to meet some of these legislative objectives. With member states, we see a, a much larger variety of uh, levels of ambition, which are partly explained by the differences in, in the nature of food system challenges confronting the member states. Uh, in, in the Netherlands, for example, the environmental pressures are, are much higher than in a country such as, uh, such as Bulgaria, and because our, our, our livestock density is simply much higher um, in France, there's big concerns about the countryside, almost literally running empty. And so, of course, the nature of challenges is much different. There's different political constellations, uh, different political groups, both in the European Parliament, uh, but also in member states, traditionally favoring different sets of interventions. But more fundamentally, we see that member states also, even after uh, uh, government, government changes, uh, that there's quite persistent differences in their what we call their policy styles, uh, which which we, we well which we explain as the standard operating procedures that governments uh, apply. Uh, a, a joke that is often made is that in in France all decisions are being made in Paris, uh, and then uh, more specifically in the Elysee Palace where Macron uh, uh, nowadays resides, and that these are being imposed in a, in a rather top down. And manner, whereas in the Netherlands we tend to negotiate and bargain, uh, which which takes such a long time that well, uh, a problem might already be be addressed by the time we've come up with a solution, or that is totally gotten out of hand, as as we see happening with our nitrogen uh, crisis. Uh, and even though these these are a bit black and white uh, pictures, 
we do indeed see that there is these persistent differences across countries in how they tackle uh, um, uh, societal issues. And in a comparison, comparative study of the Netherlands, France, and UK, we show that this also translates in how they respond to uh, these food and agricultural challenges. Where, right? for example, saw that the that France has taken a way more anticipatory approach, uh, but also more imposing, yeah, resulting also in in protest in protests. Whereas the Netherlands has been way more reactive, bargaining, consensus seeking, which has increased perhaps the legitimacy of policies, but also made that is largely fall short in addressing these challenges. Now lying underneath this, I would argue, is a, uh, a larger dynamic or, or tendency of what polit political scientists have, have called post-politics. So this is this notion that after the Cold War and the, you could say, the decline of, of, or the, of big ideologies, which we actually might see re-emerging uh, uh, today, that um, 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 in many of our liberal democracies, there has been a relatively uh, uh, strong post-ideological consensus where the dominant assumption is that, well, that there's a, a set of shared values such as sustainability, which do not necessarily uh, uh, need to be debated in, in traditional political, uh, uh, well, tr traditional political uh, methods anymore. And so we really have seen, especially also in the, in the EU, a rise of, of experts, of technocratic and managerial policy making, which has tended to downplay more fundamental differences in political views and, and, and values. Um, there have, of course, been all sorts of consultation procedures. Uh, there's formal ways of participation. Uh, but still, this is something we would typically call constrained consultation, where often the the questions or, or the policy alternatives have already been largely shaped beforehand, and, and there's no real venues or fora where more fundamental differences between political values can be uh, can be played out. Uh, and, and this is also used to explain the rise of, of populism. Uh, some would even go as far as saying, well, the, the sustainability agenda itself is a, a manifestation of populism yeah, because it's. It's, it's sort of unifying humanity in a, in a fight against outside forces, climate change, and that might actually be seen also as a populist goal, but also by not giving, not providing fora for, for more traditional political debates uh, and making that uh, actors disagreeing with this agenda uh, try to, uh, to, to well, raise their voices in different ways, uh, for example, through, uh, through more radical right uh, parties. And so I think this picture nicely shows that even though uh, there is, of course, all sorts of uh, participatory uh, uh, forms of policy making also present at the EU to many citizens, I think these, these are rather obscure and, 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 and seem far away and, and difficult to understand. Now, ultimately, the, the big question that confronts policymakers is, OK, if we uh, aim to, to to realize such a food system transition, how will we be able to, to well, literally change the behavior of, of thousands, if not millions, of Europeans? And I think that the same question applies outside of, the, of, of, of Europe. Uh, of thousands of farmers which would need to change their, uh, their, their, their farming practices, uh, cut millions of consumers which would need to change uh, their, uh, their uh, dietary uh, choices. Uh, and, and of course, everything in between. I think uh, we've, we've heard some nice examples about uh, upcycling, uh, new ways of, of using waste streams. These are all innovative practices that will be needed to foster a food system transition. And at the same time, we see that those people who ultimately need to change their behavior are hardly involved in, in policy making about the food system, uh, as we just saw with. with well, these policy making procedures taking place in, in the clouds, uh, which might go at the cost of not only the quality and, and therefore the, the effectiveness of, of uh, policies being decided upon, but also that legitimacy or, or, or that justness. And there's currently big debates going on about well, how, to, how to also make sure that in, within such a transition process, also those who stand to lose from, from these changes are, are provided with new perspectives. So the, the, the sort of 
question I've I've recently tried to tackle in uh, in my research is okay. Other uh, what 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 alternative ways or what novel ways of organizing democratic participation uh, exist out there are possible uh, to to close this uh, or at least to mitigate this democratic deficit. Um, and, and what can we say about the impacts of these novel ways of, of organizing democracy? And on the bottom, just an example of what happens if you do not involve food system actors in decision making. Uh, uh, they, they will start to protest and to, uh, uh, well, to, to, to speak out against uh, what, what is being proposed. Uh, we've seen big farmer protests uh, across Europe. And this is typically one of their concerns, even though political science literature shows that farmer groups have traditionally been quite well represented compared to many other groups. So in this, and having outlined or having, having given a, a bit of an explanation of, of why um, uh, political action and, and policy change has, has been so slow uh, or, or, or been lagging, uh, let us now turn to, to some of these more promising initiatives of new ways of organizing citizen participation in, in the food system. Um, and I'd like to start with a bit of a more conceptual discussion of what we actually mean with, with food democracy. This is something social, social scientists uh, typically like to do, uh, that we first uh, try to, to get our definitions uh, right. So we could um, we could define food democracy, which is really a, well a bit of a buzzword at the moment, as the degree of control that individuals or communities uh, exert over the uh, the functioning of local, national, transnational food systems. Well, that's that's quite a mouthful. Eh? It's that's that's quite a lot within a definition. But we actually see two different manifestations of food democracy. I think. The one on the bottom is quite a nice representation of the first, which, which by in a, in a recent article by Birim and Fine has been labeled as liberal food democracy. So also called political consumerism, appeals to the consumer to uh, 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 change their daily consumption practices, to vote with their forks, uh, and as a result, uh, try to tra change the, uh, the food system also by organizing themselves in, in new ways uh, short uh, supply chain initiatives, community support, agriculture, agriculture, etc. Then there's a second articulation of food democracy, which which is labeled strong food democracy, and those are referred to uh, well citizen-led processes that really try to relate to formal democratic institutions and then really try to address some of the shortcomings of these of these democratic institutions. Uh, so today I'll be mainly speaking about the second. So how can we, what sort of initiatives exist that could really help to mitigate the shortcomings of, of uh, decision-making taking place in our parliaments, uh, in the EU institutions, uh, etc. Some examples of, of what I then concretely mean with these, these novel ways. Um, we, for example, well, let's start on the bottom. Especially in North America uh, and increasingly also in Europe, seeing the emergence of, of what are called food policy councils. So these are civil society movements, often having an, an, a formal or informal uh, link with uh, with local or regional governments, uh, advising governments or even possibly playing a role in, in policy decision making implementation about how to uh, foster food system transitions at at least a local scale. Community canteens, community support, support agriculture, uh, farmer citizen dialogues, so new uh, new ways of um, um, bringing different food system actors together in in what we call citizen uh, deliberations. Um, and so I will I will uh, uh, reflect on uh, on, on what well, the impacts of of, of especially. Uh, these more uh, well, these types of democratic innovation try to relate to the formal policy process. Now, I've done so by relating this concept of food democracy to the political science literature on democratic innovation, because of course there's a much larger debate taking place about the state of our liberal democracies, and I think uh, all of us are much aware of the challenges that confront. Uh, our democracies. I think last year we've seen 
uh, I, I was really an eye opener the, the storming of the US Capitol, but there have been uh, much, much older concerns about the, the increase of disinformation, the, uh, the emergence of radical right parties, uh, the uh, revival of identity politics. Um, so within the political sciences, there has been an emerging debate and literature on uh, uh, on fostering democratic innovation to sort of revive our traditional democratic institutions. So democratic innovations uh, being innovative arrangements designed to mitigate the democratic deficits of, uh, of, of the policy process in traditional democratic institutions. And one of the, the big names in this, this uh, literature is Graham Smith, uh, who has played a big role in conceptualizing these democratic innovations. And we see that across the Western world, there is really an increased interest in an increasing interest in these democratic uh, innovations in referenda, citizen summits, um, as we've seen across a range of domain, domains. Uh, a famous example being uh, abortion in Ireland, where a citizen uh, panel also uh, proposed a, a way more progressive abortion policy, which was adopted by the government. We've seen uh, many citizen panels uh, emerging on, on, on climate change policy, uh, and, and, and as I will show, also in the food. Now, there's different types of democratic innovations, and these are four of the most uh, uh, common, uh, which which exist uh, uh, well outside of the, the domain of, 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 of food policy and agricultural policy. So in in the uh, which have attracted much attention in the broader political science, mini publics uh, being citizen summits uh, in which participants are typically invited through sortition, and so they are randomly picked, uh, randomly selected, and then asked to share their well to to deliberate about the big challenges that confront society and propose solutions. So actually, uh, Flanders, Belgium has quite a strong tradition because when uh, Belgium took over the uh, the world record of, uh, of of coalition formation from Iraq uh, not so long ago. In the meantime, there was a citizen movement which organized G1000 summits in which citizens from across uh, Belgium were, were invited, uh, which were randomly selected and asked to uh, uh, propose solutions for uh, for Belgian uh, for the Belgian society, which was seen as as quite a big success. And this, uh, um, uh, well, this this initiative is now being copied across countries, uh, and has particularly uh, also become uh, very popular in the Netherlands. Referenda, e-participation tools, uh, e-budgeting, where groups of citizens um, uh, get a budget of their own by governments and and can decide about what sort of projects that are being proposed. They will uh, they will allocate these uh, these budgets for. And so all innovative ways of, uh, of engaging citizens. Now, in some of my uh, most recent research, I have tried to uh, to explore what sorts of these democratic innovations have been used for food policy more more specifically to date, and what we can well what what we can uh, say about the impacts that it had on the quality of democratic decision making. But to assess the uh, quality of democratic decision making, I distinguish between four different uh, democratic goods. Uh, well, I'm not going to 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 uh, give the, the, the full definitions. Uh, but borrowing from the work of Smith, I, 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 I distinguish between inclusiveness, uh, so the degree to which different groups in society are being included in these initiatives. The popular control, so the amount of control uh, that that citizens, food system actors actually uh, get over the policy process in these, uh, in these initiatives. Uh, considered judgment, so the, the quality of the deliberations and the exchange of views and, and, and knowledge taking place within these initiatives. And then the, the, the degree of transparency both towards participants participating in these initiatives and, and, and to outside the wider public. So what I've done in a recent study is to really review the existing literature on, on food democracy and try to determine to what extent or what we know about the contributions to these four democratic groups. And what that shows that so far the scientific community has largely uh, focused on initiatives in, in, in the global north, uh, in North America, in, in Europe, 
Um, whereas there has been much less attention to more indigenous practices, governance initiatives in the global south, for example, Brazil, before Bolsonaro came to power, was quite successful in organizing food security uh, a citizen uh, 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 summits, uh, which unfortunately have been dismantled under the uh, Bolsonaro government. Um, and but these have uh, received much less uh, attention. And what we also and here you see some of the food, uh, some of the initiatives covered in the in the literature. So so far, attention has really been been given to food policy councils, which have become a very popular arrangement, and much lesser to other types of democratic innovation. And here are some of the ones in Europe that were covered in this uh, in this data. And we see that so far, these studies that exist in in, the, in you could say the food policy. Uh, field have, have, have remained largely disconnected from this broader debate taking place in the political science about democratic innovation. So, yeah, I think that as food policy scholars, we tend to sort of reinvent the wheel, uh, coming up with new concepts uh, and theories. Whereas I would argue that sometimes uh, we, we 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 can provide deeper insights, but also drawing on on all the debates within the within the broader political science as well as another discipline. Now let me share some of, of the findings because I think this also very clearly shows some of the merits and demerits of these democratic innovations. For inclusiveness, what, what, what I found was that uh, in, in these democratic innovations, especially in food policy councils, in, uh, participation tends to be the, the highest among those working in the food system, especially farmers, governmental actors, nonprofit organizations working on food related teams. Whereas there's much less involvement of, of, of citizens, especially those from more marginalized groups in society, with a lower social economic st status uh, or from, from specific ethnic backgrounds, uh, of which we know that these are often uh, suffering uh, from, from many of these, these, well, especially food insecurity, many, many of the challenges in the food system. We also see that even though there, there might and even when uh, actors participate in these initiatives, the quality of participation might, might differ, also depending on, on the time and resources that, have, that actors have available. And again, we see that better organized, more powerful actors tend to be better represented in these sort of initiatives. But, I mean, so far, we know very little about how, how participants are selected. Often, this, this still tends to be at the invitation of, of government which of course also makes that governments serve as, as gatekeepers, which can have advantages, but might also result in certain biases and, and certain groups not being, uh, not being invited. If you look at popular control, so the control that, that these democratic innovations that have over the policy process, we again see a mixed picture. But so far, they've mainly played a role in agenda setting, so sort of trying to translate societal concerns and ideas into policy agendas. Uh, they have assisted in policy formulation, uh, and sometimes also in the implementation of specific governmental programs or, 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 or society-initiated programs. But they have much less influence on ultimate decision-making and evaluation. And you can, of course, debate whether they should have an influence on, on decision-making in the first place. So, or whether they should be left with uh, a more, more traditional democratic institutions. Uh, and we see that there's also considerable differences between initiatives, which have to do with uh, the competencies that, 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 they, that they get and also that governments themselves have. Um, for example, in the US, we see that uh, uh, these local food policy councils, whereas they tend to be quite ambitious, many of the food system challenges they try to address uh, should be should be governed at a state or a, or a, or a federal level. Uh, the resources available and of course the political buy-in uh, that is uh, that is present. Consider judgment and transparency. We know way less. So there has been very little attention so far to the quality of deliberations taking place within these democratic innovations. Even though many seem to intend to at, at facilitating some sort of deliberation, I think there is a real risk. That, that power differences between participants make that some interests uh, see their, 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 their ideas and voices being, well, uh, easier find, finding their ways into policy advices than, uh, than some others. So even though there are some good practices for this in, 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 in democratic innovations in, in the literature, 
it's, it's unclear to, to what extent these have been applied so far. Transparency is largely a blind spot uh, in, in the list. So some cautious conclusions about the merits and demerits of these sort of democratic innovations, like, like food policy councils, notably, which we know most about to, to date. Uh, they could indeed, uh, as is the assumption, result in a, in a, a strengthening of the legitimacy in, in what we call input legitimacy uh, by broadening the set of actors involved in policy making. And as such, trying to break through these iron triangles, these closed policy communities, which I showed at the beginning. They might also improve output legitimacy, that is the effectiveness and, and the quality of, of policies adopted by uh, uh, improving information streams, uh, making sure that policies better connect with the concerns and daily practices of the people that these policies uh, uh, seek to, uh, to address uh, and bringing uh, the, the, the policy design and the implementation closer to citizens and policies. Those are the pros, but there, there are also some cons, which so far we, we tend, to, tend to over overlook. Um, organizing stakeholder or, or citizen participation and then not listening to them uh, might, might, might result in, in stakeholder fatigue. And this is something we see throughout the literature on democratic innovation. It might actually deepen inequalities. Uh, uh, a study on, on Birmingham, Alabama showed that where Birmingham is, is largely uh, uh, well, its majority uh, of, uh, uh, is, is, is of is black population. That the food policy council is actually dominated by uh, by, by white uh, citizens, uh, and, and there has been a fierce critique on on how the food policy council then uh, did not really uh, 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 connect with the concerns that that uh, that, that existed in in, in in the black community in. in, in uh, uh, and we see that even though these democratic innovations are proposed as a solution to post politics, to managerialism and technocracy, they often tend to actually reproduce these, these tendencies uh, uh, using a lot of jargon, which makes them less accessible to, 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 to lesser informed uh, citizens uh, and as, as such uh, also often being system reinforcing rather than, uh, and than being truly transformative. Um, now, and, and some of these shortcomings have also been, been recognized in the literature. Um, and uh, I would say we're still very much at the beginning of experimenting with these sort of democratic initiatives. And I would say food policy, agricultural policy might be a very fertile experimentation ground because food really re resonates in society and it might really be a set of issues that brings people together. Uh, and, and as such, the, the insights that we obtained from these food policy experiments might also uh, offer solutions or at least insights that can be used to, to, to tackle some of these larger democratic challenges. But of course, a big challenge is to also connect initiatives across contexts, across levels of government, from local to international levels, uh, to strengthen linkages with traditional institutions, uh, and Democratic innovation can, of course, also mean strengthening these democratic, these traditional institutions themselves. So, for example, there have been ideas about introducing ombudsmen for future generations so that parliaments also uh, well, uh, are, are being sort of forced or nudged to, to think about the impacts of the decisions they take on, on future generations. And in the Netherlands, there's quite a large debate on animal rights and on how uh, and, well, also animals in some way could be represented, could get a voice uh, uh, in, in political decision making and what it would actually mean to, to give a voice to uh, animals. Again, in Latin America, there's a much older tradition giving rights to, uh, to nature, to, to rivers. Um, so I think there's uh, much inspiration we can take from that. So let me just quickly have a look at the time uh, and, and move to the uh, third block of, okay, what can we learn from, from, from this work on food democracy for the Green Deal? Again, on a positive note, uh, the Green Deal is really the first ever attempt to move towards what you could call a food policy, a comprehensive way of, of, of uh, fostering a food system transition at the EU level. But as I've argued so far, it remains largely the top-down uh, agenda, largely technocratic, 
And I would argue there's, there's relatively little political buy-in, uh, both among many member state governments, but especially also among those who, who ultimately need to change their behavior. At the same time, if we look at what's happening in society, um, um, and, and many European citizens do actually uh, um, um, are actually quite concerned about the state of the food system and are quite willing to uh, to change toward more sustainable practices or to uh, um, 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 well at least uh, they, they, they would also they would also favor policy change as shown by this Eurobarometer survey taken uh, across the uh, EU. I'm not going to read out all of the uh, the options, but it shows that citizens are, are much in favor of, of policy change, even if it would, for example, go uh, make, make that food prices would, would, would slightly increase. Also in society, we see all sorts of bottom-up initiatives, food markets, uh, short chain initiatives, hackathons, um, uh, communities uh, uh, developing urban food policies. Uh, in, at national levels, we see citizen summits in France, the Conseil National de l'Alimentation. In the Netherlands, I mentioned this G1000 and, 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 and the Scurney initiative to organize such a citizen summit on the future of the uh, Dutch agricultural system. Um, and so within the member states, there is a lot of energy and there is a lot of initiative which could uh, possibly be, 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 be drawn upon in, in fostering uh, food democracy uh, at the EU level and across the EU. So the challenge would really be to sort of combine these food democracy initiatives, which I just showed, with these ideas, these broader ideas about democratic innovations, which I've also tried to combine in the review and in today's presentation, and see how we can build uh, novel ways of organizing uh, food democracy across, across levels of government, and then, of course, also connecting these. Now, there are already some entry points at the EU level which could be, could be used. For example, there is one institution which some of you might, might sometimes have heard of. It's the European Economic and Social Committee, which brings together labor unions, employer organizations, other organized interests. Uh, and this institution has the formal right of advice for, for, for most uh, proposals of the European Commission. Admittedly, it's a very weak institution. It has the right of advice, but the other institutions have the right to ignore them and they uh, make much use of this, uh, this right. But they have also uh, deliberated food system change and it might be a venue to, to, to build, to, to experiment with uh, some of these uh, formats. Also currently taking place across the EU is the conference uh, on the future of Europe, uh, which is also a uh, a whole series of, of citizen events taking place across the EU. Uh, I, I followed one in, taking place in Maastricht in the Netherlands, where citizens are invited to, to make their voices heard and to share their views on the, on the future of the EU. So there's already some related uh, initiatives taking place. Now, I just want to end with and it relates to this picture with a new initiative, a new uh, big uh, grant that we got awarded uh, by, by, by the European Commission, the Rise, Rise in Europe program, in which we we'll actually go, we'll try to build such a system of food democracy initiatives, connecting local initiatives with, with ones at EU level. So in this new Horizon program called Plan Eat, uh, we um, and, and will, um, which, which has the aim of well providing uh, or doing research on how to change consumer uh, behavior by also taking a more systemic uh, perspective. And we will uh, uh, organize policy summits uh, throughout the EU, inviting food, food system stakeholders and summits, as well as a pan-European uh, uh, um, summits uh, in which representatives from these national summits uh, uh, would deliberate about uh, what should be done at the EU level, and this will then result in what, what we call a food system dashboard. Don't know what it means yet, but it's something I promise to uh, to develop. And but ultimately, this this should become an, an integrated uh, set of of policy advices emerging from these uh, these citizen uh, summits, uh, which should then, of course, inform uh, the whole Green Deal and part of the change. Now, let me. 
close off by, by uh, restating some of the key messages of today. So I, I started with, with restating this, this challenge of bringing the food system inside the donut, uh, this, this donut of Cape Raymond. Um, to do so, um, the European governments rely on millions of, of, of food system actors to change their daily practices. And as a result, it may actually be needed to, to bring them into the policy process to really increase the effectiveness and legitimacy of, of the policies that, that are being developed. And I showed that these democratic in, in initiatives may be a, a tool, may be a way to do so, even though, of course, we should also stress that there are no panacea, and that they have serious uh, downsides, and that we should also very much invest in more traditional uh, democratic institutions so that they ought to be complementary rather than replacing traditional uh, institutions. And of course, um, um, the way in which this will further develop uh, both the Green Deal, uh, our state, the state of our democracy more generally, the, uh, uh, the, the, the extent in which governments are interested in these sort of innovations will also very much depend on on changes within the, the, the broader political environment. Uh, we've seen uh, that now with the, the war uh, going on in Ukraine, there's been a renewed debate about also defending our liberal democracies. Now, of course, we, we need to, to see if that debate will really crystallize into, into new paradigms, into a new world order, but it might actually uh, uh, make that, that governments will, will start to reinvest in some of these democratic initiatives. Uh, it, uh, also, political events like elections will, will matter a lot, whether or not populist right-wing parties will, will get a seat in, uh, will, 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 will win, uh, get to office in a number of member states, with French elections also coming up, but also more mundane events, uh, like how policy agendas shift, uh, what will happen now with the national strategic plans and the common agricultural policy, and uh, the, the many little battles that are being fought about the implementation of the CAP, the German government already indicating that they want to uh, target CAP funding more to public goods. And so, of course, this will also have a very large, uh, large impact. With that, um, I would like to thank you for your, uh, for your attention. Um, um, I hope uh, I, I managed to, to well, give you a bit of an insight into the, the, the sort of political science research that, that we're doing in, uh, in Wageningen. Uh, I hope that it has been at least a bit of a source of inspiration for you as well. Uh, and I, uh, I look forward to address any questions that you might, uh, might still have. Thanks a lot. Is there still time for uh, Q&A? I don't know on that. Uh, I do have one question already in the chat, but would someone like to begin in the room? I'll begin uh, with, uh, from the chat with Pauline Schilder. Yep. Uh, she says, uh, thanks so much for this eye-opening talk, Jerome. Uh, one thing that really struck me from your presentation was your comments on the miss and underrepresentation of societal groups in all stages of decision-making, including those where stakeholders are explicitly asked slash invited to share their thoughts. For me, this further underlies the importance of working on inequalities as a fundamental and essential pillar uh, for food system sustainability. What are your thoughts on how we can uh, further accelerate our efforts to improve equity and equality and improve diversity, representation, and inclusiveness uh, throughout all layers of decision? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a very big question. I mean, that's that's I would say one of the key questions in in, in political science in a broader sense. But if we look at these these food democracy initiatives more more specifically, or in democratic innovation more specifically, this has been a, a very common shortcoming of democratic inno innovation. Even when governments, civil society movements, actively reach out to underrepresented groups, that it proves very difficult. Um, to, to get them involved for very clear reasons that these people uh, struggle to, to meet their daily needs uh, and, and being able to deliberate about the food system, I would say, is quite a, quite a luxury despite the, uh, uh, the, the scale of the challenges that confront us. 
Um, so I'm afraid there's no easy answers to that. There's, there's suggestions to, to pay participants for their time, um, which, which is being experimented with. Um, um, sortition is seen as a, as a, as a good solution uh, uh, because you would ideally have a, 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 well, a, a really random sample of, uh, of, of participants. Uh, but then again, we see that that, that higher educated or, or people in, in higher social economic groups uh, tend to say yes more often. So uh, it, it is it is it is a big challenge. Yeah. Um, and actually, to uh, build off of Pauline's question, uh, Joost de Jong had, uh, has a comment and a, a related that he agrees with Pauline, and he said in the Dutch initiative the it's too expensive for a lot of people. Yeah, Heerenboeren is a very uh, popular initiative, receiving a lot of media attention. Uh, those, it's a community a type of community supported agriculture where, where groups of citizens uh, basically hire a farmer to, to farm exclusively for them uh, and they buy or lease a, a plot of land. Uh, but again, um, 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 it's it's quite a luxury to to be able to uh, to do this uh, to, to to spend time and energy on it. It's actually there's one uh, possibly coming to Wageningen, and I know that it's it's the initial investment that you need to make is two thousand euros, which many people is a lot of money, even though you could also compensate uh, for that with, with, with voluntary work. But uh, indeed, uh, it's a nice initiative, definitely. I think it's very exciting to see new forms of ownership in the agricultural sector with citizens actually owning farms or hiring farmers. In that sense, it's very interesting, um, but it's not going to solve these uh, these, these equity uh, problems. Can you take a question? Uh, yes. well, my question is, uh, given the dependency between the food system globally, so how uh, the EU sample of the initiative can be then uh, connected to the rest of the world? Is this is the first step, and then the next step is going to discuss or this initiative at the global level, or this is going to remain the EU Yeah, that's a good question. I'll repeat it for uh, those listening from uh, from home. The question is how these European initiatives would then be connected to, to global uh, initiatives, global uh, global concerns. Uh, well, actually, Alan organized an excellent webinar about the. the the more global implications of, of, of the Green Deal and also the need to to connect uh, European ambitions with with the policy agendas in uh, in, in, in other parts of the world, especially also in in in, in lesser developed countries. Uh, there is a clear need to also, uh, uh, I mean, if we're serious about tackling these global challenges, we also need stronger global institutions. I think that's very clear. And, Many of these ideas about food demo democracy could also inspire these uh, well, the global governance uh, uh, arrangements. At the same time, we've seen that over the last decade, many of these global institutions have have eroded. Uh, if we look at the WTO, if we look at uh, many of the UN institutions, if we look at the Committee on World Food Security. Um, so yeah, uh, that, that it is a, it is a big question and a big challenge. Uh, should the EU take unilateral action uh, in the absence of a, an ambitious global agenda? Um, um, uh, are there new ways of collaborating with, with a coalition of the willing globally and how to organize that? There's a lot of there's also a, a part of the Green Deal reflecting on this external dimension, but um, uh, I think there's no no easy solutions there. Yeah. Um, thanks very much, John. It was, it was an excellent talk. Um, and I can clearly see the kind of issue that you're trying to address. So we, we, we have a very challenging transition to make uh, at the present time in the food area in Europe. It tends to be a top down process without much buy in. So, can we look at these uh, democratic? <laughs> Democratic innovations to try to build uh, support. And I, I suppose I see some difference between the different types or forms of innovation that you outline. Um, and in particular, 
I do see value in the Citizens Assembly uh, approach and um, took part in, in the Irish one, not on, not on abortion issues, but on uh, climate uh, issues. But I mean, the abortion issue, the way that it, it worked is, of course, the decision remained with the uh, elected uh, parliamentary representatives. They, 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 they have to react to the recommendations from the Citizens Assembly, but they, of course, are not obliged to accept those recommendations. That's sort of an advisory kind of problem. And I think in the abortion issue, what happened was that it actually opened the eyes to politicians that what they thought was just such a hot potato that they simply didn't want to touch it. Uh, they actually found that when it was deliber deliberated in a sort of reasoned, reasoned atmosphere, that actually people could see a way forward and it sort of Open the, the, the gate of people like he said legislation. What worries me a bit about food councils, and I'd like you to maybe just explain uh, or give some examples of, of how they operate, um, is that essentially you are going to attract uh, you know the activists. Um, you know, your, your animal welfare uh, person is really, really um, uh, committed uh, to improving animal welfare. Will, we tend to be attracted to, you know, this is a platform that he or she can use. And unlike the Citizens Assembly, which is randomly selected, you're going to get very biased outcomes, at least potentially very biased outcomes. And I would have seen that as a demer, so maybe you hinted at it, but, um, you know, how do, how do you avoid that, and how do existing food councils and work in practice to kind of avoid just attracting the activists and really, you know, they're far from being represented. You're trying to create an institution which represents uh, uh, citizen opinion, but actually, potentially, at least, I can see them becoming very unrepresented. Um, yeah. And then, if I could just ask you to maybe say a word about an alternative approach, which uh, has been also very successful in in in, in Netherlands, and that is the use of legal activism. As a way of trying to bring about change, how do, how do you see that relating to the democracy? I think it's a very different approach to the courts, highly professionalized legal teams and arguments and so on. Yeah. But, but it seems to actually have been very effective uh, in, in a number of ways. Yeah, let me stop you there because yeah. <laughs> otherwise you'll come up with more difficult questions. So let me let me restate the the first question was well, how do you sort of avoid that, that these food policy councils would be would become very or that they, they might in fact already be quite biased in that some activists or, or, or groups are better represented than others. I mean that's a real concern. There's a large diversity in how food policy councils are organized. Uh, some emerge bottom up, uh, really indeed with activists taking the initiative and, and clearly that results in bias. Others are are government initiated initiated where governments generally do try to take a bit more of an effort to, to have a, 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 a the inclusion of a larger range of interests, but of course it, it, it has it, well it, it, there might also be uh, be, be other risks involved in in, in, in in letting government take the initiative. Uh, I think there is still much to be learned from from this larger literature on, on democratic innovations. There's all sorts of design principles for, for many publics uh, out there, like sortition. Uh, like ways to 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 uh, well mechanisms to sort of increase participation of of, of, of lesser of groups, um, which which so far have hardly been used. So I see that, for example, I've been involved from from the sidelines in this Dutch citizen summit, and then these are typically things that they pay quite a bit of attention to. Uh, but I, I I very much agree, and that's also why I'm personally a bit hesitant to. To, to argue that these food policy councils should come to play a, a role in formal decision making and because they, they might have legitimacy issues of, of their own. So that's why they, they could play an important complementary role, but, but I, they should not replace uh, traditional institutions. Then your second question is about, uh, you, you, you rightly stated that, that we've also seen an increase of legal action, especially in the Netherlands and a number of other European countries, which has been quite effective. Uh, that is very much true, eh? and I think that is that is a very promising alternative route of of forcing governments to take more action. In the Netherlands, some of our big rulings, uh, we've had our Nigerian case, and we've had our, our agenda case against the Dutch state, uh, 
where, where the ruling was that the government should step up its climate ambitions. We've seen a shell case where even private companies were forced to increase their climate ambitions. This is definitely very promising. Also comes with problems of its own. Uh, there's a lot of critique also on uh, from 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 politicians and, and some group well food system actors on on, on 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 the judges on the court system because I think well they they just barely point government at, at, at the uh, the international commitments that they have subscribed to um, so yeah definitely and I think there's not one holy grail in, in how to govern a food food system transition I think we sh we should try all of these different routes also because the problems are simply too urgent to uh, to to bet on 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 one horse, uh, and I think the legal route is a very interesting complementary one, which seems to be paying off at least in the Netherlands. Although we, we still have to wait for the results, but at least has has forced government to change some of its policies. Uh, so I would say it's it's end end rather than uh, rather than all. And one uh, final question uh, from Pitt. Yeah, I just wanted to comment briefly on what, what you were discussing on the, uh, the, on the uh, democratic innovations and then representation, the representativeness of the groups of citizens that interact, like that G thousands that you main, uh, men, uh, mentioned. And what I have to think about being an ancient historian, of course, about the direct democracy in ancient Athens. Yeah, where the Athenians would have considered every form of representative democracy a contradictio in terminus because of a very direct system. Now, of course, for practical reasons, they still had to sometimes fall up, form smaller gremia of people that had to make decisions about it. But if they did that, they let that completely be decided by chance. So by lot, from all eligible citizens, people would be selected. Uh, and of course, that was also a subgroup of all the people there. That's a different story. But I mean, couldn't something like that play a role more where you uh, more randomly select people from the wider population and then also like the Athenians did remunerate these people for the time that they serve on these boards and that was not necessarily for years but for a number of months and then a new group. Yeah. Uh, could something like that maybe? Have a yeah, sure. And that's the old, I think the people at home will probably be able to follow this. Uh, that's the old idea of sortition in these citizen summits uh, that you need randomly select people from, from the population at large. Um, what I take from this is that where I look at recent initiatives in my, my review, that perhaps we should write a paper on what we can learn from, from ancient history in terms of democratic innovations. I think that would be a, that might be a very interesting uh, interesting collaboration. Sure, sounds like something interesting. Yeah, I mean, in the Athenian yeah. example, it didn't work out in the end, but then again, in the long run in history, yeah. things don't tend to work out, so that's the we, we try and fail. Hopefully we do better. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. All right, thanks a lot for your many excellent questions. It was a big pleasure. Thanks to the people uh, at home for their questions. And uh, of course, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to, uh, to, uh, to contact. Final Okay, so <clears throat> our next speaker is uh, Atem Watch. He uh, just arrived on Friday, a new press fellow. <laughs> it's all right. Um, so he will be directly in the action. 
just arrived and you will do your presentation. So Atem is a uh, has an expertise in the area of a molecular and physiological aspect of a plant uh, mineral nutrition. So he got his PhD in 2005 from the University of Montpellier in uh, France. And then he did a postdoc at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland <laughs> until 2009. And then he stayed for two years. He was in Belgium in Ghent. So he worked as a senior scientist in a crop design company, uh, this BASF company, in fact, so based in, in Ghent. Uh, in 2012, Swatem so was recruited by the INRA at the time, or it's INRA. Um, and in 2020, he joined the Michigan uh, State University, where he's working in the Department of Plant, Soil, and Microbial Sciences. So the floor is yours, and uh, people just will ask for questions in chat. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Christian, for this kind of introduction and for the invitation. Yes. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Annette, also for organizing and facilitating my meeting. So, uh, of course, the connection with the previous uh, talk it was a food, and uh, we can talk uh, about food only if we can produce plants, because the plants are the main entry of mineral, a lot of uh, nutrients for the food chain. So uh, before starting, I, uh, this is the brief plan of my presentation. I will present to you how, uh, uh, why we are working on plant mineral nutrition, what are the challenges, and how we are transforming these challenging challenges and opportunities. Then I will try to give you a couple of examples to, to show you why we are interested by studying combinatorial nutrient stress and uh, why this is important at this stage particularly. Then, of course, a brief conclusion for my talk. So plant mineral nutrition is one of the oldest field of research. So it uh, goes back to two centuries. As you can see, uh, for example, in 1850, once a German scientist was showing the importance of nutrient for plant growth. So plant take nutrient from soil, and, uh, and uh, by roots, and then it's transferred to different uh, parts of the plant in order to complete their life cycle, and when we say life cycle, from seeds to seeds. So David in 1850 was shown that plant needs a lot of essential nutrients. It could be macronutrients, so the plant needs this uh, nutrient in large quantity, or micronutrients, so a small quantity. But as soon as one of these nutrients is missing, the plant productivity and yield uh, we start losing that symbolized here by this water leak. But in order to compensate the nutrient deficiency on soil, the current agronomic approaches is to fertilize, use a lot of fertilizer like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, etc. And this is uh, uh, this practice uh, uh, is uh, is the way now to compensate mineral nutrition in soil. But if without this is a heavy fertilization, 50% of the world population will go hungry. So we need this is approach in order to feed uh, uh, people globally. Nevertheless, this is approach is very important, but at least they show three uh, disadvantages. The first is expensive. As you know, for example, the price of nitrogen, phosphorus, etc. goes and fluctuate with the price of uh, so the second one, we know that the plant only will take 10% of what we are, we are putting in soil. So the remaining part will reach the water's body and cause eutrophication, like for nitrogen or phosphorus. And then the third and most importantly, this is big uh, challenge challenges in sustainability. And uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, uh, particularly true for phosphorus. So experts agree on saying that uh, uh, because phosphorus is not a non-renewable material, so there is no industrial way to produce phosphorus like nitrogen, because nitrogen we still, we still can produce nitrogen in, uh, thanks to harbor uh, process, uh, harbor bosch process. But uh, for phosphorus, if we don't have phosphorus, that's it. So no phosphorus, no food, and the peak is expected to be uh, decades from now. So let's, we can debate about when the peak will occur, but for sure that the quality of phosphorus that we will have after this, this peak, it will be very, uh, very dangerous for food production because the phosphorus that we'll be using, it will be heavily contaminated with the heavy metal like cadmium. 
So we will, and you, uh, European legislation will not allow us to use this bad quality of uh, phosphorus. So no phosphorus, no food. Phosphorus cannot be replaced by another element. The peak is there. So we have to find a way to, uh, to increase the resilience of plant to phosphorus deficiency. So phosphorus is very important, as I was mentioning. Here you can see corn plant growing in the part of the field with phosphate uh, deficiency. They have a hard time to grow to complete their life cycle. Plants that uh, have received enough phosphorus are growing healthy, and of course, it will be associated with enough uh, yields. This is not surprising when we know that phosphorus is a key component of our DNA, the DNA, RNA, or energy that stock, uh, uh, molecules that stock energy in the cells like ATP, ATP, but also the phospholipids that protect the cells. So phosphorus is very important for plant growth, and this is the major reason why, because it's an important constituent of uh, many uh, cell, uh, cell membrane, uh, molecule for energy, DNA, but also a lot of sugar as well. So one, one idea is to increase the capacity of plant to absorb phosphorus from soil. So we, we, as I have mentioned, we have phosphorus in soil, but the plant will take only a small fraction. So one possibility and one strategy is to increase the plant to absorb and accumulate more phosphorus. And of course, this is, was the one of the questions during the last 20 years. And the researcher was able to discover all a number of the genes that act in concert in order to improve the phosphate uptake from soil. And basically what they have done, they have taken plants, they put them at the phosphate deficiency, and they try to identify what is up-regulated or down-regulated. And this is the pathway. I will not go in details of the, the genes, but basically the take home from this slide is that we know what are the genes that are involved in response to phosphate deficiency. The problem now is that this pathway is working in very controlled environment, in greenhouse. So if we have increased the expression of phosphate transport to 101, we will have more phosphate in plant. But now, if we go to the field, of course, this is not working. And uh, part of the response why this is not working is that for many years now, for almost more than 20 years, we were focusing only on phosphate to soil, so how plants respond to phosphate deficiency. And we have ignored that the plant, the, they, uh, they have to be informed in real time how much phosphate they have in soil, but how much they have nitrogen, how much they have iron, etc. So we are trying to solve one problem at a time, but this is not, not what happened in real life, because in real life, plants are exposed to many, many deficiencies simultaneously. And the plant have to uh, to integrate all these signals uh, in order to, to decide to grow or not to grow. So the plant cannot here say, I don't have phosphorus, so I have to increase phosphorus. Because they don't have at uh, the same time, for example, zinc, they don't have at uh, the same time cobalt. They have to adjust. And this is what we call, call, uh, we call balance or uh, nutrient emergencies. So uh, there is an interaction between nutrients. And this is interaction has been ignored for many years. And this is because we don't understand well how the plant regulates the homeostasis interaction of nutrients. We are unable to provide a solution, biotech solution, to improve the plant nutrition in real field. So this is the pathway that I showed you that we, in laboratory, it's working nicely, irreproducibly, and the modification of the expression of any of this gene lead to increase or decrease phosphate, so it's working nicely. However, in our, our lab, we showed that this is pathway will never work if we combine phosphate deficiency with nitrogen deficiency. In other terms, the plant will not care about phosphate deficiency if they don't have nitrogen available. So if we combine nitrogen deficiency and phosphate deficiency, the plant will give a priority to nitrogen. And the, the explanation for this, as you can see here, when we grow plants in the presence of nitrogen and phosphorus, all this gene in black, uh, so this is, means it's steady level. And the phosphorus deficiency, all this gene in yellow means this gene are upregulated. This is include uh, all the pathway that I showed you. Now you can see clearly that uh, uh, nitrogen deficiency plus phosphate, this gene seems to be specific for phosphate. But if we put minus uh, plant in absence of nitrogen or absence of phosphorus, all the phosphate Deficient, uh, deficiency gene response are not uh, induced at all. 
And this is a clear molecular evidence that uh, if we would like to improve the phosphate efficiency response of plant, we have to take into account the presence or absence of other elements. So in absence of uh, combined nitrogen and phosphorus efficiency, the plant will never activate the phosphorus efficiency signaling pathway. So now I will talk about another uh, interaction, which is of, uh, between phosphorus and zinc. And uh, as I told you, for many years, we, uh, the experiment in the labs was to take a plant, put them the, at the phosphate deficiency, and see what is changing. And this is obviously is not working. So we have to think about alternative strategy. And Kak um, and Marshner in 86 showed that the plant that grow in the presence of zinc and the presence of phosphorus, so normal condition, the accumulator lot of phosphorus and root. This is what you see as white here. This is auto rated uh, level of the phosphorus. So the phosphorus here in white. But as soon as we put the plant in a minus phosphate, and despite the presence uh, minus zinc, and despite the presence of uh, phosphorus in the, in the media, we can see the plant accumulate more phosphorus in root and accumulate a lot of phosphorus in shoot. And this is indicate that zinc deficiency activate the phosphate uptake in the plant. So this is was not uh, is counterintuitive. It's surprising why the plant will activate the uptake capacity and accumulation of phosphorus just under the zinc. So they need more zinc. They don't need more phosphorus. So this is was one of the questions that we try to to solve, and especially we the idea behind if we discover how the plant accumulate, absorb, and accumulate more phosphorus at the minus zinc, we can take these genes, modify their expression in plant, and make the plant accumulate more phosphorus that is present in soil. So uh, to make the long story short, so for a couple of years, we were working and discovering this is a new signal pathway that allow plant to absorb more phosphorus from soil, and we discovered a new pathway, and you can see here, you can see here is not the same genes that are activated by minus phosphate alone. Here, ranging from uh, for one h 3 a couple of transcription factors, and you can see here other phosphate transporter and controlled by B023, and this work was in collaboration with Mark Arts and uh, published in uh, a couple of years of your life. So the take home message from this slide that for many, many years we were focusing on solving the problem of phosphate deficiency by testing how plants respond to phosphate deficiency. It turns out we can improve the phosphate uptake and accumulation of plant just by playing an availability or signaling of other elements. So this is a second example that I would like to show you to, to illustrate how important it is to study the interaction between the nutrients and not focusing on one one element at a time. And if you see many university, you can see there is a lot of labs that focus in one element at a time. It's important and essential to do, but we have at the end of the day to put it in larger context. Now I will come to a very recent uh, publication appeared in Nature Communication from our lab. And this story started with uh, one uh, PhD uh, student coming from Thailand in my lab working with rice. And we started by applying combinatorial nutrient stress and rice. This is rice plant should grow in the presence of phosphorus and iron. This is the uh, uh, iron deficiency, it's well known, is a chlorosis. And the chlorosis is the yellow of leaves. So if we look around, we can see leaves are yellow. We can think it's because iron deficiency. But when we remove iron and phosphorus simultaneously, the plant recovers the accumulation of chlorophyll and looks green again. And this is, of course, is intriguing. We cannot imagine that stress plus stress will recover the plant growth capacity. So therefore, it's really important. Why this is important? Because there is a lot of plants that are used for biofuel, like switchgrass, and uh, they are targeted for uh, marginal land. We will not use fertile land for biofuel crops, so we would have to put them in marginal land where there is low nutrient. And these plants have the capacity to grow in this marginal land, and we have to understand why they are growing, why they are green, and uh, how we can use them for biofuel protection. So for this reason, uh, I will focus now for the rest of my talk about two elements, iron and phosphorus, and we try to understand how the, how the plant will integrate phosphorus and iron signaling in order to control photosynthesis. So as I told you, plant will take phosphorus and iron from soil by roots, transfer them in the shoots, and as soon as we don't have iron in the soil, the plant turns yellow, which is, as I mentioned, it's chlorosis. 
So the chlorosis is, uh, when the chlorosis are occurred, it can account for up to 30% of heat loss. So iron is very important for photosynthesis, and uh, the deficiency of iron is associated with the chlorosis, which is uh, very important uh, to maintain photosynthesis activity in order to maintain uh, plant activity. So this is also can have an important implication in human health. So uh, if we if the, we have less entry of iron in the plant, so we will have less entry of iron in the food chain, and this is we can see with iron deficiency, anemia, and mortality. And uh, this is of course is a million of people around the world that are suffering suffering from iron deficiency. In order to cope with this is uh, iron deficiency in human, so we have to increase the iron uptake and accumulation in plant. And this is uh, for this we have to understand first of all how the plant regulate iron uptake and accumulation in the context where the many nutrients are changing. Of course, I told you that plant growing in the full uh, full nutrient are green, iron deficiency are yellow or chlorotic. And as uh, I told you as well, that when we remove both elements, the plant turns green again. So in order to understand the molecular basis of this phenotype, I collaborated with the SURI and Stanford University and went for sabbatical two years there in order to use the system biology approaches. And uh, first of all, we tried to, to, to show if this is phenotype phenomenon is common between monocots and dicots. And for example, this is uh, that wheat, sorry. So this is uh, uh, that wheat, so it's a monocot. Rice, of course, monocot, and Arabidopsis is dicot. And first of all, we, we can see that iron deficiency has a similar effect in chlorosis, and uh, that as soon as we put the plant in the combined nutrient stress, we can recover uh, the green color, which is reflected here by the chlorophyll content. So we can see the chlorophyll content have this certain level, decrease it under minus iron, and recover it under combined stress. Now we know that it's conserved between monocot and dicot, and this is, gives more relevance to our work because we can transfer it from one plant to another, and especially as I was mentioning for uh, bioenergy crop. So uh, we know that uh, the chlorophyll accumulation and photosynthesis take place in uh, chloroplast. Sorry. Yes. So, as I told you, we know that this takes place in chloroplast. Therefore, we quantify how much chlorophyll content we have in Arabidopsis thaliana. The idea this experiment, this experiment, uh, they, we grow plants in normal condition and then we transfer them and uh, either minus iron or uh, combination of the stress. And uh, you can see clearly that. Uh, the red line is iron deficiency. 39 hours after the transfer to minus iron condition, the chlorophyll content in Arabidopsis plant decreases. Okay, so uh, here, because we are talking about chlorosis and the recovery of uh, chlorophyll content when we are in double stress, so there is two hypotheses. Either the plant and the combined stress, they will uptake a bit more of iron, and this is a small fraction of iron, is enough to make the plant green again and photosynthesize again, or is different, because if it's not nutritional explanation, so we are going to the world towards signal uh, explanation. So here, as you can see, we use the iron staining protocol. We stain uh, the iron uh, in leaves of wild type plant ground in presence of iron and phosphorus. And what you see here as brown color, this is iron. 
You see, as soon as we put plant under minus phosphate, there is a lot of iron accumulated, so it becomes more darker. However, under minus iron alone, or minus iron minus phosphate, we don't see a clear iron uh, accumulation difference. Of course, this is visual, and we confirm that uh, this is uh, observation via quantitative approach, and we can see there is no difference in iron or bioavailable iron accumulated either under minus iron or the combination of the stress. So by this, by doing this, we excluded the first hypothesis that under minus iron minus phosphate, the plant absorb a bit more iron, thus allow the plant to recover. So now we are more towards a signaling pathway, not about nutritional status. So therefore, this is bring me to the previous slide. In order to understand how the plant will integrate the two signals. So we cannot uh, wait until the, uh, the yellow leaves appears because this is too late. So we are treating the response. We would like to uh, identify the early response. And this is, we have to be uh, to place ourselves before the phenotype appears. Therefore, we, uh, we follow the chlorophyll uh, dynamic of chlorophyll content and the minus iron and combination of the stress. You can see clearly 39 hours after the minus iron stress starts, there is a decrease in chlorophyll content. But in minus iron, minus phosphate looks like while that plant growing in normal condition. So it's enough, 39 hours after the start of iron deficiency, we can see, see decline of chlorophyll content. And this is put up, uh, uh, correlate nicely with the photosynthetic activity. 39 hours after the transfer, we can see clearly the difference between the activities. Therefore, we decided to use 39 hours, 52, 76, in order to understand what happened. What happened? What makes difference between plants that turn yellow and the other plants? So, of course, I will not go into the molecular details. This is just to tell you uh, our approach it was to go through uh, screening, uh, screening or analysis of gene expression. And we have identified a lot of genes that are upregulated, downregulated specifically by minus iron. And we focused on the 32 genes that are specifically downregulated by minus iron, but they remain at the same for minus iron, minus phosphate. And this is where our target, because there is difference here. And as you can see, this gene are enriched for photosynthetic related uh, proteins. So this is, makes sense. And of course, in our strategy, 32 genes is a lot. And if we are going to study them by mutation, and uh, we have to order Newton, second line, etc. So therefore, we decided to use different approach and go and look for upstream regulator of these genes. So therefore, we, we, we took the 32 genes expression in almost 700 accession of Arabidopsis, and uh, we ran GWAS. And this GWAS gave us two candidates. And you can see this is with the sort of the mystery of iron and phosphorus interaction of plants. One of them is encoded for H44, and this is this will transport ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, and the one transcription factor, which is BZ58. So in order to show that these are indeed the genes that are involved in iron and phosphorus interaction of plant, this is the first mutant wild type plant. So uh, green and the uh, normal condition, yellow and the uh, minus iron, green and the uh, combination of the stress. But the mutation of pH 4.4, the ascorbic uh, acid transporter failed to stay green and the combination of the two stress. So this is an indication that the transport of uh, vitamin C to chloroplast is important to make, mitigate this stress. And as you can see, if we added ascorbic acid or vitamin C to the media, uh, while white type will stay green, despite the absence of iron, the, the transport of ascorbic acid uh, mutation uh, lead to, uh, to the mutant that is failed to stay in here. So this is clear indication that this is a cause of gene. Having pH 4.4 function it is important to stay green type and the uh, uh, combination of stress minus iron minus phosphate. And likely because this transporter will take ascorbic acid, which is antioxidant, that we take uh, as well in our case, in order to relieve some stresses. So this is, gives us uh, uh, the first gene. The second gene is BZIP. The BZIP is also behaving like H444. Stay, stay yellow under combination of stress and in contrast to wild type plant and also fail to, uh, to stay green despite the presence of ascorbic acid. So what we have 
as a conclusion here that we have that ascorbicacin need to be transported in the chloroplast in order to protect the plant from iron deficiency uh, stress. I will uh, skip this one and uh, go to to first conclusion. So we have identified two genes. One is BZP nucleus, one uh, PH44 in the chloroplast. And these have to work in tandem in order to produce more uh, ascorbic acid under iron deficiency and phosphate deficiency for by stress. This ascorbic acid has to be transported in the chloroplast, and when the ascorbic acid is transported in the chloroplast, it's expected to mitigate the, uh, the stress. And what's the kind of stress can be mitigated? It's source. And this is, is this is compound is expressed in plant and human cells. And when we are under stress, we produce a lot of frost and this is have a negative effect on our cell function and then plant is accumulated in many parts but including the chloroplast so having ascorbic acid coming here will reduce the level of ROS, and by reducing the level of ROS, we allow the chloroplast to function and the plant to stay green so we have measured how much ROS the wire produced by minus iron and uh, this is a schematic, a schematic uh, presentation and the normal condition is the level of ROS. And the minus iron, the ROS increases a lot. And the combination of the stress, the ROS level was too low. And now, if we mutate both the genes, BZ58 or PH44, the ROS level was too high. And that's why these two mutants failed to stay green and the combination of the stress. So now we have a clear idea why plants stay green and the minus iron minus phosphate. And this is basically because. Uh, because the plant will express BZIP58, which will produce more ascorbic acid or vitamin C. And this is, will be transported to the chloroplast. Once inside the chloroplast, they reduce the level of ROS. By reducing the level of ROS, the plant stay green. So I will uh, not go much more in, detail, in, in details, but I would like to summarize what I was telling you. And the normal condition we have the vitamin C produced, transported to, uh, to the chloroplast, where it's, uh, the ROS level is mitigated, and the, the photosynthesis is maintained, and the plant looks green. Now, under minus iron, the ROS is produced at a high level, and is not enough uh, for the accum accumulated ascorbic acid to limit the ROS accumulation, and therefore, the gene that are encoding for photosynthesis protein are limited and that's why the plant are yellow. If we subject the plant to combination of the stress, minus iron, minus phosphate, the, the vitamin, uh, the uh, ascorbic acid is produced to the level of the wild type plant, ground normal condition, the ROS is limited and the photosynthesis is operating and therefore we have green plant working. <laughs> So the conclusion, I hope that I showed you that uh, the response of the plant to combine stress is a general rule rather than exception. So we have seen uh, that uh, plants when uh, they are exposed to phosphorus and nitrogen are responding differently from phosphorus alone. I showed you that uh, phosphorus and iron effect in plant photosynthesis capacity is different from the single one. Therefore, we have to study the plant nutrient response as a combination and not in single, of course, it's, uh, studying in single effect is important, but we have to keep in mind that we have to take the plant mineral nutrition as a system. So, uh, to improve the plant resilience to nutrient stress, we have to consider plant mineral uh, nutrition as a system, and uh, this is uh, the vision that we can we can have. So, we have to consider first of all the interaction between the different uh, nutrient in planta, because this plant nutrient can interact also with soil. Then from that, we can use uh, the gene regulatory network. So how the, what are the genes that are induced by a combination of nutrient stress? Once we identify key genes, then we can validate their role for plant growth and development. So I will stop here to take more questions and to clarify part of this talk. But before, of course, I have to uh, thank all uh, the contributors for this work, ranging from INRA to Michigan State University and collaborator from family and uh, having NSF in the US. <coughs> Thank you for your attention. I see Mark is uh, writing a question. So during the time he's writing a question, we will <laughs> ask him the audience. Is Christopher? My former head on and 
and ask about so so if in the case in the case where uh, iron availability is is hard to achieve, right? So if I'm drawing that soil, doesn't have very much iron or, or maybe it's being tied up in the soil. Um, it would be possible then to uh, actually improve plant growth by uh, by somehow limiting phosphorus. Uh, so yeah, the idea is is not to grow the plant uh, with limited iron or limited phosphorus. So the idea is to identify the gene that enable a plant to grow with limited iron and engineer a plant to mitigate this response. Because as I was mentioning at the end of the day, the plants are very important to, uh, for iron and phosphorus entry in the food chain. So, so the idea is to limit this is negative response of the nutrient availability in the plant growth and not to limit their presence. So uh, it, it's highly recommended to improve the plant capacity to um, absorb iron because iron is there, but we have to improve their capacity to absorb it with different other strategies like covering secretion, etc. But in the same time, we have to limit the effect of iron limitation on photosynthesis because it's not the iron per se which is important, but the signaling generated by iron deficiency which is there. So if we limit that signal, we can still contain, uh, continue to have plant growing, and by growing the plant demand will be increasing. This is the philosophy. So, so now remember I work with trees, so the likelihood of you know. I've, Genetically modify a tree to do that, you know, the next crop still alive as well. Uh, so, would it be possible, say, to design like an RNA product that could be sprayed on a tree and convince it that it's uh, rolling phosphorus so that it picks up more iron? Yeah, so it's, it's true that under iron deficiency, the plant will absorb more, uh, under phosphorus deficiency, the plant will absorb a lot of iron. Okay, but iron should be controlled at a certain level because excess of iron is toxic. Deficiency of iron is, is negative. So uh, the is not is not only a matter of increasing the capacity of iron, but its use efficiency because we have to be the plant the plants have the, the process to keep iron in certain range, not uh, going to the excess and not going to the deficiency. Excess of iron is 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 very negative, for example. If we have a lot of iron, the plants stop to grow. They will stop to grow, they should stop to grow, there is toxicity as well. So I think the, the best strategy, for example, we have identified transporter of ascorbic acid to the chloroplast. This is to be targeted. So to or to increase the production of this ascorbic acid and make it more in chloroplast in order to mitigate the loss. I think this is could be a strategy uh, uh, and it's you easy to do because its metabolic pathway is well known rather than playing around the transport of chemical of iron, which maybe we cannot control at that level to avoid toxicity. Yeah, so I have a comment and a question from Mark Martz. Uh, he says, very nice work. He's, I'm wondering if you have any ideas on why the plant has evolved this signaling mechanism. Yeah, thank you, Mark. So. Uh, the idea why the plant have evolved this is signal mechanism. I think that uh, because the plant, like in alkaline soil, there is a lo low content of iron, phosphorus, and other elements, and because the low availability of this uh, element, the plant have to grow and continue in photosynthesis. This is, could be one explanation: is to adapt to large part of the, the soil what, where both elements are absent, and the idea is to still maintain photosynthesis activity. This is, could be one possibility. Uh, number, please. Um, nice presentation. Thank you. Just to let you know if, um, if you modify the, the amount of minerals in the soil, there is this symbiosis between plants and microorganisms in the soil, and this change in the composition minerals in the soil will be affected with this symbiosis and can affect the growth Yes, yes, you're right. So the idea is the, ch the changes in component. Actually, we are not changing the composition. So we are trying to mimic what is in nature. In nature, this is, this is the composition of nutrients in soil. They are variable. And uh, of course, for example, we know that iron and the iron deficiency, the plant will secrete some uh, coumarins in order to 
to eliminate what is pathogen and uh, allow to beneficial bacteria to grow and likely to give uh, a bit more iron. This is uh, one. This is one change in the effect in, in my microbiomes. For many years, we were thinking that the fungi will give more phosphorus to the plants. And now it's not really the case because it's, it's a combination between plant, fungi, and microbial. So it's a, it's a, a work between these three organisms in order at the end to give the phosphorus to the plant. So I agree with you that the composition of iron, uh, of nutrient in soil will affect the, the microbiome, the microorganism in soil. And this is so far not taken into account. You can, you can see how difficult to work with two elements at the time with the yeah. control scrap. Of course, we are going toward that direction, plant microorganism interaction and plant nutrition availability, but of course, there will be a competition for that for sure. Okay. 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 So, the plant can be talking about the device, usually like NEK ratio that has to be a modifying change to the other plant. Like, I uh, haven't seen, like, have you uh, patched the passion by any chance or do you think, uh, because I, mean, I know it's very tricky to, uh, to have multiple minerals at the same time, but yeah, as you have always seen, like, there has been influence of the nitrogen with respect to phosphorus. Is it the same with passion, like, with respect to the networks? Yes, so what I know that there is a study published two years ago about potassium and iron and the response to uh, potassium deficiency of all iron signaling. And this was nature from Anna Man lab. And uh, this is even more complex because it will involve a uh, difference in methylation, I think, uh, profile. And this is will affect the oxygen accumulation, which affect the root growth and therefore the uptake. So yes, but uh, what is your question as who can can bring me to say that the MPK, this is a fertilizer composition, and now people realize that it's important to take into account the ratio between the element. They start to adapt the fertilizer composition to the soil, the pH of the soil, which microorganisms are uh, present in order to propose the best composition of fertilizer, not going bluntly like this. Because as you can see, if we put a lot of phosphorus without knowing that the plant or the soil is zinc deficient, we will cause over accumulation of phosphorus and we will have a negative effect on biomass. Therefore, we should understand the soil composition and adapt the fertilizer to that position. We have one question, one more question from Mark Arts. Uh, I think again about the single, uh, signaling mechanism. He said, but if Fe and iron and phosphorus are low, uh, this will go wrong? Question mark. Yes, of course, if uh, phosphorus and iron are both low, of course, uh, it, the plant will have a hard time to complete the life cycle. But uh, the point here is to understand why the plant will, and how the plant will integrate these two signals in order to stay green. And once we understand the mechanism, we can use it in the benefit of other plants uh, that are the targeted to grow in marginal land, like switchgrass or herbs. But of course, these two elements are essential for a plant to grow to complete their life cycle. But this is, is fundamental question and we have to understand that in order to make it useful for other plants as well. I don't know Amark, if I answered your question, but I will be happy to discuss with you further in two days. You can unmute your microphone. Uh, Am I allowed? Oh, that's good. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I I think you answered my question. I'm I'm just intrigued, eh, because it looks like a nice uh, assist. I think everyone thought, okay, iron goes down, plants become yellow. Eh? That makes sense. And then you show, uh, but it's not always like that. Eh? There can be conditions, and the plant, because uh, these plants are iron deficient, and then they still uh, are green. So I was just wondering, could it be that uh, it is a kind of a uh, uh, preventive mechanism so that the plant indeed is very careful not to grow when there is uh, less iron. But in case there's also less phosphor, then maybe the effect is not so bad. Then the plant has to grow and, and maintain photosynthesis because otherwise it will never make the life cycle. Could that be a reason? Yes, so uh, very good question. So recently I, I proposed the review to trends and where I proposed that iron deficiency response, the chlorosis is not a defect. Is, uh, is an adaptation. So yeah. 
we are saying this. For example, we can see that sometimes that if the plant shut down the photosynthesis, they will produce less sugar, and they it, which can be not used by the pathogens. Maybe shutting down the photosynthesis is an adaptive response by the plant waiting for better condition to grow again. This is, could be a possibility, and we know that uh, affecting iron homeostasis could have the uh, effect in pathogen response. And this is, could be uh, could be one of the output of this is work. So we don't have definitive response, but of course this is could indicate is an uh, adaptive response. Yeah, thank you a lot. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. See you in a bit. <laughs> I have a yes. question, maybe. Um, sorry, this, this is also new for me, but in the beginning of the talk, you also talked how these things are related uh, to nitrogen in the soil. And um, some of our uh, Greenview fellows have talked a lot about uh, new policies related to, to nitrogen. So if we are starting to regulate nitrogen uh, in the soil, and this uh, uh, this also is very uh, integrated with um, these being uptaken into the plant for iron and phosphorus. Um, uh, I guess, could you talk about maybe what the implications would be for some of these uh, nitrogen um, yes. limits? Yeah, so all this is, uh, this is a limitation for the use of uh, nitrogen is to reduce the entry of nitrogen in the environment, limiting of uh, degradation of water value. Of course, all this work was based in plus nitrogen, less nitrogen, etc. But of course, these people have not taken into account the attraction with other nutrients. So if we decrease the entry of nitrogen, we can have a great application of the accumulation of iron, and we will have problem of biofortification of iron and zinc, etc. So my, my humble uh, opinion is that we cannot solve the problem of uh, nitrogen alone without taking into account what would be the general application of the uh, nutrition of the plant. This is one. And the second, uh, I think uh, nitrogen, there is an impact on the environment, is expensive, but we can still produce the nitrogen. The plant have the capacity to absorb what is in the atmosphere. We have a lot of nitrogen. I think the most and the next, next crisis is phosphorus because phosphorus is limiting. And the second, there is two or three countries in the world, they have, I think, 80 to 90 percent of phosphorus reserve. I think China, Morocco, this, sorry, these two countries have more than 80 percent of worldwide reserve of phosphorus. So if these countries say, sorry, I cannot give you any more phosphorus, we can always think about nitrogen. So I think the priority are not in the same right places. It's important to talk about nitrogen, but it's not as dramatic as phosphorus. And, yeah, thank you for this talk. Uh, so the question about with phytate, uh, the relationship between phosphate and then phytate in the plant, uh, then for the consumer, and because that of course can chelate the the other elements for the consumer, would that have a, a consequence? What is the idea just to uh, get the phosphate up to normal levels? Uh, yeah. So the the phytate is the uh, stock of phosphorus in the seeds. Okay. So the plant, uh, they stock phosphorus in seeds at the end of plant life cycle as a phytate. And for many years, the people trying to decrease the level of phytate because we think it's not good. And there is, but now I think there is uh, going back to say, hey, phytate could be beneficial also for the health. And the, the idea to reduce the level of phytate maybe it was a wrong track. And, uh, the, and we can see clearly if we decrease the level of phytate, the plant uh, like APQ1 mutant is not growing normally, but etc. So it's, it will be delicate in order to just target to decrease the level of uh, phytate, but uh, it will be very important to maybe to to better understand where, what what is the role of phytate. Just to give you an example, now we know that phytate form of phytate, let's say AP8, is the signaling for phosphate deficiency. So because the plant will sense AP8, phytate is AP6. So there is AP7 and AP8, etc. And each class of these inositol phosphate you have an important role in plant growth. So going blindly like this and decreasing the AP6 will affect the other molecules that are very important. 
So we are still in early phase to decide what to do with the criteria, but of course this is uh, also something to think about for future. I have uh, two questions. So a couple of years ago we showed that uh, uh, cadmium treated plants, so they, they were fluorotic, and if you induce magnesium deficiency at the same time, does it change the cadmium concentration in the plant for addition? But uh, the chlorotic uh, symptoms can be eliminated. Do you think that the, the tandem you are describing here can be applied to other combination of uh, nutrients? So uh, I think that uh, there is, uh, at least for ascorbic acid transport of the chloroplast, could be one of the reasons. And why I'm thinking that? Because if you apply ascorbic acid to your vitamin C in the media, in presence of cadmium or other vitamin, the plants stay green. And it's not only ascorbic acid, there is glutathione. Mm -hmm. And you know that the glutathione is also involved in cadmium stress. Yes. So uh, if you put a plant in cadmium presence and you add the glutathione, the plant becomes green again. So I think this process of transporting ascorbic acid in chloroplast is one of the, the mechanisms. Still need to be experimentally validated, but there is a good uh, chance to do this. Maybe that's an interesting question for you also. Um, my, my second question is, the, I was lost a little bit with the genome-wide association. Uh, all yes. the children you showed. <laughs> yes, yes, I want to very fast on this. Okay, so what, what I can the... explain rapidly. So, because sometimes we have to validate a gene from uh, ordering mutant, one line, confirm a second, this is, takes a long time. So what we do, so we are, so we, uh, we have 32 candidates, gene differentially regulated. We, uh, we, uh, we could find the expression level of these 32 candidates in natural population of Arabidopsis, publicly available. How many? Uh, 700. So, so we can see that this is the expression of this gene uh, very in the natural population. And from these 32, uh, 32 genes and the expression in 1000 genome, we can derive the PC1. Principal compound one for all their expression because they are correlated, right? And then we use the PC1, one single uh, values for the 32 genes to run each gene. So, and from that, of course, there is condition. The, the, the expression of this gene are very nicely correlated. This mm -hmm. makes sense to use PC1. And then from PC1, we use EG was, so we use that uh, value to run EG was. And the EGWAS will give you the upstream regulator for this type of Okay. Can you measure this in roots or shoots? Uh, so, uh, for an odd, so this is publicly available in shoots. Okay. Uh, yes, much for the presentation. Uh, also, I'm going to probably, it's a bit of a problem, it's a bit of a problem. So, uh, two or three years ago, it was published on the next one, the post follows the efficiency and uh, activate a boost of immunity. And I was wondering if uh, uh, the description there, the uh, analysis that you've done, what kind of combinations was made with nitrogen or uh, with uh, iron, if you will see a boost of uh, immunity or not. Yeah, so uh, we can rephrase for the. So the, the question was uh, the link between phosphate deficiency and immunity response in plant, right? Yes. Okay. Case, yeah. So directly from our data, it was uh, it was not upper, okay. But what I can tell you that under under pathogen attack, the first thing that the plant do is to shut down the phosphate uptake capacity, and this is a very recent paper in current biology from Switzerland. So they what they show that uh, what they, uh, uh, they it's very elegant work. They use the root hairs. They can use it uh, for electrophysiology work, so they use the electron. And they show clearly that uh, under a pathogen attack, the plant uh, reduced the expression and activity of H14, uh, one of the main phosphate transporters. And then in the mutant of H14, this is the response is not there. Still is not clear why the plant and the phosphate deficiency boost the immunity response, but this is tight connection between the two, uh, the phosphate deficiency signal and the immunity response. The second paper it was a nature paper from Jeff Dengel lab in microbiome and phosphate deficiency, and they showed that pH1, I was showing here, they play a role in the microbiome that go inside the excited of the hospital. And this is the second thing as well. But still not clear why the question, this is how, 
But why is it not good? Nice. With this, we can uh, close maybe some uh, announcements from uh, Annette. Uh, first, uh, thank you so thank much. You very much. on biostimulants uh, and biostimulation. We have um, some different companies and also uh, scholars from, from our team and from outside uh, coming to present on this topic. And on Thursday, the 17th of March, we have uh, another two uh, wonderful Brias talks by our uh, Brias fellows, uh, Professor uh, Ferran Antolin, uh, who will speak uh, about archaeobotany uh, in the Mediterranean, or in Mediterranean, and then um, Dr. Uh, Tarika uh, Ramchi Kuru, who will talk a little bit more about, uh, uh, pardon me, Arabidopsis again, but um, from, from another point of view and on uh, root morphology, like that. Yeah, so yeah. a bit more on, on that topic. So uh, please, we welcome you to join us. And uh, please spread the word about our events. And to those uh, out there, please follow us on LinkedIn and our website and other social media. And once again, thank you very much for coming today. And thank you for joining us uh, in person and online. Thank you, Annette. So we see each other uh, for lunch on Thursday and then for the biostimulant uh, workshop next uh, Wednesday, which will be in Solvay.